Well, we are continuing our series on Choose Wisely. And again, I love that opening video because some of those folks are not choosing very wisely. One of the things I love about Cincinnati is uh, my son goes to college down at UC. So last night after services, I got on my jet ski, drove down to the Red Stadium, picked him up, and we went jet skiing down the Licking River for about a couple hours together. So I love adventure. And we're going to talk about the metaphor of the adventures we take, whether it's a hike, a canoe, and how we really make decisions on which turn to take and which one not to take. Speaking of choosing wisely, if you came in today, you saw there's a sign on the door that said this service is rated PG-13. Uh, and that is true, so depending on where you are, nothing we're going to say is particularly uh, offensive. But we are going to get into marriage, love, sex, and things like that in the service. So if you have kids with you and you think that's not something that they should hear, just know we're going to talk about that. I'd be totally comfortable with, uh, with talking to my kids about it, but I want you to know that as well. You know, the Bible is written to a group of people in a desert culture, the Middle East. And part of being in the Middle East is that water was so valuable. And often when you make decisions, we can go through desert times and decisions where we felt like, oh, I was so confident, I knew exactly what to do, but I'm not sure what to do here. Or you go through desert times in your marriage, or desert times in your career, or sometimes we go through desert times where, man, our kids, we just connected so well until this particular age. Today we're going to talk about in decisions how we invite God's love to rain down into our situations before the desert comes and sometimes when the desert has already arrived. Riverbed that comes just off the Little Miami River. It's one I used to hike, I don't know, 100 times with my kids when they were 8, 9, 10, even up to 12 years old. I love this place. And yet every time I hiked here, I never thought to myself, this is what Israel's like. Six years ago, I took my first trip to Israel and I imagined lots and lots and lots of sand. But instead, what I found was lots and lots of rocks. In fact, during our trip, we hiked through several of these what are called wadis. What's a wadi? A wadi is a dry riverbed. It is filled with sand, but it's mostly filled with rock. And a lot of times, as the Israelites were marching through the Bible, or one of the metaphors used by shepherds or some of the psalmists, is that of a wadi or a dry riverbed. Now, a wadi was a dry riverbed because the culture in the Middle East is that there's a rainy season and a dry season. During the dry season, you might have no water in your rivers for months at a time. During the rainy season, you can all of a sudden have a flood that comes your way, 10, 20 foot. Well, if you don't prepare during the dry season to dig wells, you're not going to have any water in those later months. And I don't know about you, but when I think of a well, I think of a wishing well. You know, like Jack and Jill went went down the hill kind of thing, and you, you wind the bucket up and you get a big drink out of it. Or growing up, we didn't have city water. My dad built our house and actually had a well put in our front yard. It's a straight down kind of well resource. In Israel, many people got their water from the river. That was the resource. If you're going to build a well, a cistern, you would actually dig into the side of a riverbed at an angle. Deep, deep into the riverbed. Sometimes it was hard rock. But you would dig deep into that and you wouldn't just have a small well, 5 foot. You'd go 10, 20. I walked into a few that were 30 to 40 feet deep. And some were about 12 to 20 feet wide. So that when the wet season came and the water was 10, 20, 30 foot tall, it would fill up your cistern. It would fill up your well. And as the water came down for the dry season, that might last two, three, even six months, you would actually walk over to your well, dug into the side of a river bank, and you would have what was called still water. You may recognize that from Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd. He leads me besides still waters. Still waters are the captured resources that give you rest. These are the cisterns that a farmer would use to take care of his crops during the the dry season. This is the water he would use to nourish his family. But if he didn't prepare by digging a deep enough well and enough of them during the dry season, he wouldn't be able to capture the water during the rainy season. 
And here's how the, the writer of Proverbs relates this to you and I. He says, digging cisterns is critical in our life. You've got to make your marriage a priority. You've got to make your relationship with God a priority. You've got to make all of your relationships, your friendships, your connection with your kids a priority. And when the waters are rushing through here, business opportunities, chances to expand, you're going to have not enough time to dig a hole in the side of a mountain. Because eventually the water level is going to go down. And when it does, you're going to need to drink from the wells. The well you dug for your relationship with God. The well you, you built for your marriage and dug into your marriage. You're going to find when those dry seasons t- come, when your kids are 17, 18, did you dig wells when they were 5, 7, 12, 13? So you have the reservoir and the, the relational capital there to pull from during the difficult times of parenting. We are built for relationship. Relationship with God, with friends, with marriage, and with kids. But if we don't prioritize that and dig it out, we're going to find ourselves pretty barren during the dry seasons of life. Water is designed to sustain us during the desert of decisions. In fact, when we were in Israel, it was interesting because, like I said, there were just rocks everywhere. We were hiking out, seeing shepherds, which were often girls, actually, even today, just like back in the day. Twelve-year-old girls with their five-year-old brother leading herds of sheep through, look at all the rocks, just thousands, millions of rocks everywhere. We hiked up, got to see some sheep, hiked down into the wadi. And it was so dry, so hot. We hiked for many, many days, not seeing any water, any reservoir. And then we came to a national park called En Gedi, the same place that David met with his men hiding from King Saul. And we came across a waterfall. And I fell back into that waterfall. I'm like, oh my goodness, this is so good to have fresh water in the desert. We took it in, and then we took another hike through one of what I mentioned earlier, the wadis, these dry riverbeds. As you can see on the right, there's some holes dug down on the lower part of the wadi. So large are these caverns or these cisterns, you can see our group here on the left going down into the cistern. And they would put these wells several miles, and so a good shepherd would lead their sheep and know exactly where the next still water source was. Well, the writer of Proverbs is going to relate this concept to our relationships. And here's the question I want to ask. With all our technological advancements, with all of our social media, why does it seem that our relationships are more shallow than ever? That we don't dig very deep wells these days? It's because I think when we come to questions, we often ask one question when we should ask two. And the first question is a good one. It's one we should ask when we come to decisions, but it's counterbalanced by a second question. We say to ourselves, what is the cost if I don't do this? Go back one slide. What's the cost if I don't do this? Well, you know what? If I don't do this with my career, oh my goodness, that's not going to set me up for the next stage and the next stage and the next stage. And often we use that to talk ourselves into things. We already want to do that. We already want to buy that house. We already want to go that direction. We already want to take the next advancement. And so we sort of convince ourselves to keep moving in that direction by only asking one question, which is, what will it cost if I don't do this professionally? That's a good question. But there's a second question we also need to ask. What will it cost me relationally if I do do this? Can I be the kind of father I want to be if I start a brand new business when my kids are two? And it's going to take at least three years to get it off the ground. Or should I wait? What kind of marriage are we going to have if we commit to three traveling sports teams in every weekend for the next ten years of burn up? Yeah, 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 but if we don't do that, they're not getting to college, they're not going to get a full scholarship. Okay. It might cost you that, but let's also, also weigh the cost of what's our marriage going to look like when we lose all the weekends for the next decade. 
Now, we did traveling sports. I'm not against traveling sports. I was a traveling uh, soccer team most of my life. My sister was on traveling volleyball. She was also on traveling softball. My parents decided there was a way to do both during several seasons of our life because it was a way for them to connect with us. My dad coached. He actually began our traveling soccer team. My parents would say their best friendships occurred on those weekends. They met their best friends in those weekends. So there's no guilt here. I'm saying, but make sure you've asked the questions. What will happen if I don't do this? But also, what will happen relationally if I do do this? Is this going to allow me to deepen the wells of my relationships with my kids, with my spouse, with my God? So I want to look today at one question. And then we're going to sort of build all kinds of tributaries to that. But one question that we can ask and then three words to go with it. And here's, here's what I think is going to be helpful. You can't drink where you don't dig. And if we don't dig deep wells in our spiritual connection to God, then the desert comes and we're going to have no place to drink. If we don't dig deep wells in our marriage, there's going to be a winter desert time in your marriage. And if you didn't dig a deep well, you're not going to have the reservoir to sustain you. So how do we dig so we can drink? Well, the one main question everything's going to be built around today is this. The priority test. The priority test. Given my current responsibilities, is this the best decision at this time? It might be a great decision in two years. It might be a great decision in three years. It might be a great decision right now. But when I go to make the decision, I need to ask, given my current responsibilities as a husband, as a wife, as a dad, as a a leader, is this the best decision at this time? And to think a little bit more about that, let's talk what it means to dig wells. Because part of this being the best decision at this time is, will this allow me to have the kind of friendships I want, the kind of recreation I want? the kind of deep marriage I'm trying to develop. Let's reflect on some of these questions. If I make this decision, what kind of health and recreation do I want? Am I going to have any time for actual hobbies if I do this? What kind of friendships do I desire? And will this decision allow margin to build those kind of friendships? What kind of marriage will this job or decision allow me to have six months, two years, three years from now? What kind of mom and dad can I be to my kids at this age if I make this decision? How about this? Will this decision, this schedule, allow me to have the margin to stay emotionally filled up for my spouse? How many of us are like, at the end of the day, and we don't have any energy left for our husbands or our wives, and the other person is frustrated by that because we didn't build a schedule And we didn't make decisions with enough margin that we'd have some emotional energy left over for the thing we say is most important. Will this allow me to lead my family in spiritual habits? So today we're going to look at a note, a handwritten note from a father to a son in the book of Proverbs. And Solomon writes to his son and says, Son, my son, pay attention. If you just do what the culture does, you're going to have no margin. You're not going to have very deep relationships. You're just going to do more, 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 and it's going to wear you out. So my son, pay attention. And the main thing there is the word pay. Every time you make one choice, you're paying for it by not doing something else. There is going to be a cost to these decisions, which is why we need to ask, what's going to cost me if I don't do it? And what's going to cost me if I do do it relationally? Pay attention. I want you to lean your ear, lend your ear toward understanding. Now, my dad loved fishing. Now, I knew he loved fishing, but I didn't. Because he had, sitting in his lazy boy, he actually had a, 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 a lure-making uh, contraption sitting while he sat in the lazy boy. He was making these things, but he never went fishing. It was surprising to me. He'd ask me to go fishing occasionally, and I could make it about a half hour, and I was like, I'm kind of bored. He invited me into that, but he realized that none of us, my brother, sister, or I, love fishing. So I just figured Dad didn't love fishing until we all got out of college. And I realized Dad had paid the cost of putting fishing on the shelf because we didn't share that with him until we all were out of the house. And now I can't get on his schedule because he fishes all the time. 
He said, is fishing, if my kids don't enjoy it, the best thing for this season? He put that on the shelf for two decades. My dad loves motorcycles. Sold his Harley Davidson when we were first born. And bought himself a new one when he retired. (laughs) And I can't get on his schedule now. He's this weekend, actually, at another carpool with one of his motorcycle groups. And I've been to Sturgis with him twice. But he put several things on the shelf. He had to pay because during the seasons when we were young... He made the priority coaching, connecting, things that we could do together. My mom, who is a very successful businesswoman, put her career on hold for many, many years because she wanted to take that time when we were young to be with us. It's interesting, my wife and I are as close to empty nests as we're going to be. I've got a 20-year-old, an 18-year-old, both in college, and then I've got an 8-year-old autistic son who is probably going to live with us the rest of his life. So it's interesting that I'm making different decisions now and I tried to find things that my kids love. So we played volleyball together for the last six years. We play every Sunday over at uh, 50 West for the last six years. We've gone to Perfect North once a week uh, for the last 13 years during those seasons. It's one of the fun things we've done. Because my kids wanted to do those activities with me. It allowed me to deepen relationships on the drive out there. We talked what's going on in their life. On the lift rides, we talked about it. Everybody's like, you're going to go out west and you're going to hate Perfect North. No. I went out west, loved it. It's definitely better. But Perfect North was an opportunity to do something I loved with the people I loved to deepen those relationships. And so now I'm, I'm at a point in my life where I'm thinking about picking up flying. So I've taken six or seven uh, lessons on flying. But I put that idea on hold for many, many years because it wasn't the best decision given the responsibilities I had. So I wrestle with that. And there's no guilt here. It's just wise choices. Look at all the time that certain things take out of your life, whether you're a a gamer uh, or whether you're into golf or whether you're into fishing. Given this particular time, might one of those hobbies need to go on the shelf temporarily given your current responsibilities? Or might you want to not advance the company so that you can have time for some recreation like golfing or volleyball or whatever it is that you do? Pay attention. It's going to have a cost to do this. So, the writer continues and gives us three words to think about this and how to dig good wells. And the first one is the word drink. Drink. Will this decision create deep wells in my relationship? So as I make this decision, as I go down this path, is it going to allow me to create deep wells I can drink from? Here's how Solomon tells his son. Drink water from your own cistern. Not somebody else's cistern. So you're going to have to get out the shovel and you're going to have to make decisions at each stage of your life. Am I, is this going to help deepen my marriage, deepen my friendship, deepen my ability to connect with my kids? Drink well water from your own cistern and running water from your own well. Why is running water in a well? Because it ran in there from the wadi. Should your fountains be dispersed abroad, streams of water in the st- streets... In other words, don't overcommit yourselves, over-disperse the water source so that you don't have a reservoir. It isn't that what most of us do. We so disperse ourselves that we don't have the emotional, spiritual, physical energy connection to actually invest in our relationships because we got so dispersed. So how can I dig wells that allow me to have a sustainable pattern to really have the kind of relationships I want to have now and the ones I want to have later? I had a friend of mine who ran for Congress. and uh, It was right when his kids were in junior high and high school, and he, he got elected. But he really wrestled with Washington, D.C. is not a... Uh, um, what is it not? It's not a lot of things. Uh, It's not a hallmark card for how to have a great marriage, typically, right? You're isolated, you got a lot of power, you're away from your home, you're away from your kids. And he saw it as a real temptation. He said, I really want to serve, but I'm concerned about my relationships. He set down specific goals for his marriage, specific goals for his kids. And every 30 days, he said, he checked in, was he making the time to connect with his kids in the midst of this job? He told me, he said, I wanted to make sure that 10 years later, I didn't have regrets. And the only way I knew to not have regrets if I was going to make this decision was to have very specific, accountable, um, relational goals I was also tracking every month. And I could come back and tell myself, no, I did prioritize that. No, I did do that. So I don't know what the mechanism is for you, but how are you going to dig cisterns you can drink from? 
For me, when I was 22, I took my last name, Hovind, and I made character qualities. And these character qualities allowed me to decide, what decisions am I going to do? And they do allow me to become who God wants me to be. So mine were H. Humble. Is this going to allow me to deepen my humility and create an environment of humility? Is this going to allow me to be other-centered? I had specific other-centered goals related to my wife and each of my kids and what I thought they needed. Is this going to make me verifiable? As a creative storyteller who has a tendency to, to... to exaggerate some of my stories for just the sake of storytelling, but did I exaggerate it to make myself look better? I would really challenge myself to make sure I was being honest and verifiable in what I said and what I did. I, I wanted to be a person who initiated. I was the one who got stuff done at work. I was the one who got initiated as a husband and didn't sort of begin to coast downhill after we were married. I wanted to initiate as a dad and be the kind of dad who was engaged. That was going to be a core value by which I made decisions. N was the needs of others. And I went into some details in my sort of broader scope on that. And D, I wanted to be dependable. Now, this last summer, I came up with a new list. It's shorter. Maybe because I can't remember as much. I'm not sure. But everything I do is now going to be filtered through these four things. Connection. My health. Because if I want to be a father to an eight-year-old autistic son, I've got to get stronger. He is very, very strong. He needs me and he's going to continue to need me, I've got to be healthier and stronger than I've been. Connections. You'll notice that my wife's up there. My three kids are up there, but there's a new name up there. Brandon is now in my goals because my daughter's been dating him for two and a half years. So when we decided two years ago to go on a spring break trip, I said, hey, Sierra, why don't mom and I go with you and Brandon? And so we took him on the first spring break trip, and then we did it again last year. We all stayed together in one hotel room for a week. I said, we're going to get to know each other. My wife and I were in one bed, my, wife, my daughter was in the other bed, and he was on the cot by our, our, uh, our feet. <laughs> I'm going to teach him some humility, too. <laughs> we had a great time. And this last summer, we did the same thing again. And so now I decided what I'm going to do, what's going to allow me to build friendships with my kids and my potential new family members that may come in the next couple of years. But that helps me in making decisions. Authentic friendships. I have spent so much time devoted to my main friendships and connections being my kids. I'm at a phase now. I can actually begin to branch out and build friendships outside of my family circle. It just hasn't been a priority. It's been on the shelf for a while. And then my D is I'm determining Quinn's direction. How do I set my stage to set up Quinn for the most amount of success with his ABA therapy and to set him up for where he needs to be when he's 18 and 21? So... You can come up with your own, but that is so, so helpful for me in making decisions. And you can see so much of that is saturated with deepening relationships. And so I run everything I do through that grid. How can I drink? And what do I want to drink from two years, five years, ten years from now? Drink. The second word is rejoice. It's one thing just to drink of relationships. It's another thing to make relationships you want to rejoice in. So the writer goes on and says, rejoice. Another question is, will this decision bring joy to my marriage short term and long term? Now, I am a sanguine. I love having fun. So when you talk to me at a party after church, I don't ask you what you do. It would be my third question. I ask you, what do you do for fun? And I'm always amazed that 99% of the people I ask, at any environment, any place, I get the same reaction. Hey, what do you do for fun? It's the last time I had fun. I, uh, well, honey, we, we, we what? Uh, I'm like, oh, my goodness. Now, truly, after they sort of get past the, the startling, like, I haven't been thought about fun in years, they go, well, we do enjoy watching our kids do this. How can we make decisions that allow us to rejoice? And look what the writer says. He says, let them be only your own. That was, drink your own cistern. If you don't build a cistern of joy, you're going to be tempted to drink out of somebody else's cistern. You're going to go through dry times in your marriage and say, you know what, maybe I married the wrong person. And you're going to say, they look happy. She looks happy. He looks happy. And you're going to want to drink out of somebody else's cistern because it looks, from a distance, like it's fresh water. It's not. When you didn't dig your own cistern, you didn't create a fountain by which you could rejoice in. He goes on, he says, let your fountain, this well becomes a fountain, be blessed and rejoice in the wife of your youth. In other words, don't swap houses and swap spouses. When you didn't dig the reservoir of your own marriage, and you're like, you know what, I think I'll find a new wife. 
No, rejoice in the wife of your youth. Rejoice in the husband of your youth by making that a priority to dig deep and make wells so that you can have joy in those relationships. And that means you're going to have to come face to face with the reality. The reality is you can't do it all. I saw an interview with uh, Indra, who's the uh, CEO of Pepsi. And she spoke as a woman how she has wrestled with this very thing in her career. She said, I don't think women can have it all. We pretend we have it all. We pretend we can have it all. My husband and I have been married for 34 years. We have two daughters. And every day you have to make a decision about whether you're going to be a wife or a mother. In fact, many times during the day, you have to make those decisions. She admits that meticulous planning her life has allowed her to be a decent parent. Like, oh, if I could just be a decent parent. I'm I'm with her on that. And she believes her daughters have asked would say she's a good mom. But I just like the honesty of saying, man, sometimes you're going to have to decide if I want this long term, I'm going to have to modify the pace at which I get this other thing. You've got to pay attention. Another CEO of Ernest & Young is sort of known for the culture he's created in this very area. His name's Mark. He says, at any moment, you're going to feel guilty about what you're not doing. But isn't that the truth? At any moment, you're going to feel guilty about what you're not doing. That's why it pays. It costs something to make decisions. Because when you choose to do one thing, you feel guilty that you're not doing the other thing. Like today, he says, I'm missing the World Economic Forum in Europe. That's a big thing to miss and feel guilty about because I'm moving my daughter into her dorm room at USC. Wow, how did the dorm room become more important than the World Economic Forum? That guy wants to dig some deeper wells. In fact, that culture has so saturated his company that he was doing, uh, it was at the Great Wall at a convention in China, and they had to leave to catch his flight, and several say, hey, can we do some more selfies with you? He said, you know, I would love to do them, honestly. I can't because I've got to catch this plane to be back on time because I'm taking my daughter to her driving lessons. And that spirit of knowing how work hard, high goals, high productivity, and great relationships has become part of the culture there at Ernest & Young under his leadership. Drink from your own cistern. Rejoice. Make a fountain of the relationships in your life. And then thirdly, what does it mean to satisfy? And here's where it gets a little PG-13 R-rated here. And again, what I love about this is that we're, even as Americans who watch everybody sleeping with everybody on every TV show all the time, we're still like, but it's so weird that mom and dad might make love. Like, every neighbor, every friend, every stranger on every TV show is making love, but it's weird that, like, married people who are committed to each other, who love each other, might actually enjoy their time in the bedroom. It's just weird, Right? And the Bible is not in any way prudish about the subject. He says no, one of the ways that you're going to build your own cistern is you've got to prioritize your love life. And here's how he says to do it. Have I learned, is the question, to communicate about and to prioritize my love life? Most couples I talk to, no matter what age they are, they don't know how to communicate about it, and they certainly haven't prioritized it. And they wonder why there's resentment. And they don't make decisions that give themselves any emotional energy to prioritize that area of their life. And they wonder why things aren't going well. Here's what he says to Solomon. Solomon says to his son, As a loving deer and graceful doe, let her, your wife's breast, satisfy you at all times and always be enraptured with her love. Why should you, my son, be enraptured by an immoral woman and be embraced in the arms of seductress? In other words, if you and your spouse aren't prioritizing your sexual relationship, your love life, if you're not making that a priority, figuring out how to communicate on that, figuring out how to prioritize that, you're going to fantasize and drink from somebody else as well. You're going to be tempted to say, oh, this isn't working real well. I must have married the wrong person. Oh my God. Because you're not going to do the hard work of digging into this awkward sometimes conversation, you're going to say, well, I'm just going to swap spouses and swap houses. He said, no, no, no. I want you to learn how to satisfy one another. I want you to learn how to communicate on this issue. So let me give you sort of three drill downs on this. Number one, you need to have language that you can talk about. So part of figuring out how to do this is to make it a topic, not a talk. And this is true if you're a parent talking to your kids. Or like, have you ever had the talk with your kids? 
And I, I talk to folks who are going through premarital counseling all the time for weddings, and I ask all the time, hey, how often did your parents talk to you about the birds and the bees or talk about intimate relationships? 90% of the time, it's never. And the other 10% of the time, it's yes. I say, what did they say? Some version of, D- wait till you're married. It's like, that's it? <laughs> did they talk about how, like, in marriage, there's going to be awkward moments, and sometimes you're not going to last as long as you wanted to? Did they talk about the fact that there's going to be awkward moments where what worked last time doesn't work this time, and you're going to have to figure out how to say, hey, don't do that, it's kind of annoying? No. <laughs> well, how are you going to know how to talk about it later when you don't know how to talk about it now? I don't know. So one of the important things we do as parents is we've got to make this a topic, not a one-time talk. My daughter was home. She's 20. I probably brought it up five times while she was here during the summer. And I would say that's a regular pattern. And is it awkward to start into it? Sure. But I want to say it's always going to be awkward, so let's get past it being awkward. Because we've got to help our kids set up. This is a topic you need to have instruction on. You need to be able to talk about. Because I tell you this, every marriage is talking about their relationship in the bedroom. They're either talking about it in unhealthy ways. We haven't talked about it in three years. You're talking. You're communicating. So it's not very healthy. You're always going to communicate about your love life. It's either going to be healthy or unhealthy. So how do you make it a talk? Not just, I mean, how do you make it a topic? Something that we get increasingly comfortable with. Not just a one-time talk. So I know couples who prioritize this, and they say, we check in every six months, or we check in every year. How are we doing? What are some ways we can grow in this? I know you want more variety. That's not really my thing, but okay, let's talk about it again. I know your appetite's bigger than mine, and I liken the idea of, of a crock pot. Usually one spouse is a crock pot. It takes a while to warm up. Or as one friend of mine said, my spouse is burner burnout years ago. And the other person's a light switch. Always on, always on. Is there, is, can you turn this thing off? Oh, my goodness, this thing turn off? And that is true, and I've had, though men often are stereotyped as that, and it's true, I've, I've had couples that we've counseled with where the woman had a higher appetite. And so how are you going to deal with that? And how's that going to change during postpartum? How's that going to, going to change during menopause? How, how are you going to communicate with that after a prostate cancer? How are you going to learn how to talk about this important area in your life? You've got to make it a topic, not just a talk. Which means the second thing, you need to communicate. And part of that communication is going to be learning to compromise and stick with it. I remember when my daughter was 13, we got a book called Every Woman's Battle. It was about how to talk to your kids about the birds and the bees. It was like the last five chapters for parents to read, the first five chapters you'd go through with your son or daughter. And one of the things it said was so important in making it a topic was to give your kids adult language to talk about this issue. No longer were topics like down there, your pee-pee, your wee-wee, going to be sufficient for having adult conversations. So whether you go with the medical terms or other terms, part of that process, it really told you to tell your kids, we need names for this. Whether you're comfortable with the medical names, we're going to talk about penises and vaginas, or whether or not, like in the Song of Solomon does, the Song of Solomon in the Bible is sort of a a sex guide, a seven-chapter sex guide in the Bible. It actually has technique in there, and it refers to the woman's vagina as the garden and the man's penis as the fruit. And it becomes sort of a poetic way for them to talk about it. But the point is, they found terms to talk about it. And it's so critical that we learn how to talk about this issue. And almost every sex therapist you'll read about, talk about, go to, will talk about the second thing. You've got to learn to compromise and stick to it. Meaning, check in and say, all right, you'd prefer this number, I'd prefer that number. It's not really about the number, it's about us connecting. But there's definitely a way in which you feel more connected when it happens this often. What what are we going to agree to? And that, that may seem unromantic, that may seem ridiculous, but that's sort of how real life works. And that seems weird. Except when you talk to most couples, it's just true. And it may change during seasons. But almost every sex therapist will say you need to learn to compromise. And then you need to stick to it. Which means if you've got the more aggressive appetite, and you've agreed to, whether it's twice a week or twice a month or twice a year, whatever you agreed to, you need to actually stick to that. Otherwise, the person feels hounded and you're not keeping their word. And vice versa, if you've stuck to, hey, we agreed to, you know, okay, if not tonight, you know, whatever you agreed to, the other person's wanting that kind of emotional connection. And so the important area of not only learning how to talk, but learning how to come to a compromise and then sort of check in, is this still working? And, and how do we make this work? And how do we talk about this? Now, why would you do this? Like, why go through all the awkward of this? Why, why can't it just work like in the movies where somebody kisses a woman on the back of the neck and, well, oh my goodness, we're jumping in the bedroom? Because men are writing that stuff. That's why. That's why. That's who writes these scripts. That's why. It's not real life. The third reason is what Solomon says here. He says, The reason you need to prioritize your love life is because you're protecting your marriage. You've got to prioritize your love life 
because you're protecting your marriage. Because what happens is when you don't know how to talk about this, when you don't know how to have these sometimes awkward, sometimes great conversations, you end up not enraptured in your marriage, but enraptured by the adulterous woman. You end up enraptured by the immoral woman, and you get embraced by the arms of the seductress. And everyone looks good from a distance, and then you'll eventually destroy that relationship because the same dysfunction you have not knowing how to talk about it here will eventually show up over there. And so what God, through Psalm, is telling his son is, I want you to have deep wells in your marriage. Deep wells with God. Deep wells in your emotional life. Deep wells in your love life. Deep connections in your friendships. But to do that, you've got to start seeing your decisions through that lens of, is this going to allow me to be the kind of person, the kind of spouse, the kind of parent that I want to be? And when those things are in conflict, what's going to trump what? Two questions. So all of this is hung on this. When you come to a decision, what's it going to cost if I don't do this? But what's it going to cost me relationship, relationally if I do do this? So we gave you in this series a bookmark with a series of six questions. I've focused primarily on one question today, even though there was lots of sort of ways to think about it. And that was the priority test. The priority test. In light of my current responsibilities, is this the best decision at the time for me, relationally? Or to say it this way, where do I need to invest my time in order to actually have the time of my life? So that I don't get to the place of retirement where I look at the person I've been, you know, parenting with for the last 20 years and go, who are you? And when's the last time we really hung out? No, no, I need to invest my time now so I can have the time of my life. I need to invest in my marriage and family and my relationship with God the same way I invest in my retirement plans. It's strategic. It's purposeful. It's thought out. It's planned. It's measured, right? Now, for some of you saying, you know, this was helpful, but honestly, Chad, I got a lot of work to do. I'm not sure how to do that. So starting the next week, we're going to have a real drill down here on how to do that in two areas. Uh, we have a... a six-month, seven-month um, weekly meeting for guys. It's called The Great Adventure of Manhood, where we actually, in the same way I did it with my last name, Hovind and Chad, it's going to show you how to make a strategic plan to actually align who you want to be, how you're going to do it, and how you're going to put decisions through that grid. Doug does that in the mornings. It's called The Great Adventure of Manhood. You can get the details from your program. But if you're not a morning person, because it meets at 6.09 in the morning, you know, right before God gets up, I'm a night owl, so I'd love to do church services at 11 p.m., quite frankly. Um, we also have an evening group that John Kirby is leading called Horizon Dads. And we're going to, again, just try and be honest about how can we be better? How can we pursue God better, more intentionally in our relationships? How do we get better at this thing? I love this last song we're going to do today because it's by Green Day. And Green Day was reflecting on decisions and time and how to not live in the regret of the past and the lead singer, Billy, was actually wrote this song because he was frustrated as his girlfriend. His girlfriend had decided, despite the fact she was dating a rock star, to go to Ecuador and serve the underprivileged. And he wrote this song you're going to recognize as he was wrestling with how she wrestled with how to make this decision. And listen to these words in the spirit of somebody who chose a life in Ecuador over dating a rock star. Let's listen together. Well, isn't that what we all want, to have the time of our life? So how do we make decisions accordingly? Well, let's, let's pray and ask God for some wisdom and ask him to help us to make those decisions. Father, we thank you just for what practical advice you gave, but ultimately how you displayed that through your son Jesus, that he came and prioritized relationship over a cross. He prioritized connection, connecting deeply with us over, over being brutally beaten on a scourging post. So, Father, in light of what you did for relationship, will you show us how we can prioritize that? How we can love career advancement. We can love activity. We can love busyness, as I do. But put it through the lens of your wisdom that we would create and become the kind of people you want us to be. For some here today whose marriage is not in the place they want it to be, Father, would you give them hope that a new way is possible? For those who are under just the, the, the exhaustion of no margin, would you give them wisdom 
and learning from this season to make different decisions? God, would you let all of us have the grace to know that our decisions may not be somebody else's decisions, not to judge other people who decide differently from us, not to feel superior than other people, but to be honest that all of us are just trying to, as best we can, pursue you. And all this, Father, we give you the credit. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks for being here. Next week is our last week of Choosing Wisely, and we're going to be on to a whole relationship series about how to deepen our marriages. Thanks again.